uh, I wasn't expecting to see you uh, that that you were you're going to be that much today, but it's definitely nice. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here in France uh, in in this wonderful city. And uh, as you can probably see, I'm a bit nervous, but uh, hope it's going to be fine. Um, so before we begin. Um, I'm giving this talk uh, for the first time in public, so I uh, will appreciate any feedback afterwards. So um, please uh, use the joined in link to give feedback or just come to me or email me or just tweet about me or whatever. Okay, uh, let's get to the chase. So um, today I'm going to be talking about building PHP applications and, and deploying them somewhere. And I'll share some of my uh, practices or uh, some some findings I've, I've uh, found during my like experience uh, but before I do that I'll do a quick intro of myself so uh, as it was mentioned already uh, I come from uh, Lettonie from Riga um, I worked in ID since around 2002 uh, currently I'm an engineer at, uh, at Casco which is a uh, uh, insurance startup based in London. Um, I'm also a student uh, in the University of Latvia, where I'm like trying to get my science degree, and I'm also AWS certified. So, right. So as I said before, uh, if you have any comments, feel free to uh, tweet during my talk. Um, any any feedback is much appreciated. Right. So. Um, before we go further, uh, I would like to like define some terminology that I will use so that uh, we are all on the same page. Um, uh, so, build. What I will mean by build when it's a verb. So, build process. It's kind of an action, right? Um, build. Um, what I mean when I say build or build process. Uh, it, it, it's a basically a process of transforming or converting some source code into into something uh, and the key thing is that it is a process so it can be automated um, I will mention some tools you can use to automate uh, things and further slides but keep in mind this is a verb so the next thing is build as a noun um, and by that I mean basically uh, an output of the previous uh, step, which is uh, the, the build process. So build process produces a build, right? Uh, well, I mean, in in, in, uh, in the world of compiled languages, this could be, uh, I don't know, a binary. Um, in, in other cases, this could be a Debian package or, or a jar or, I don't know, even a virtual machine image or a Docker image. It doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, the, the important thing is that it is an artifact that includes everything that is kind of needed to actually run your application. And, um, well, it, it, in, in the world of PHP, it is a bit tricky because you don't compile PHP apps. That's why I have that source code thing kind of uh, in, in italics. Uh, because in PHP, we need uh, the source code actually to, to run stuff. We don't compile things. And then the third thing, uh, what I mean by deployment, which is, I think, pretty obvious, is um, it's a process of putting or deploying the build, the thing we got in the previous step, to, to one or many servers. It doesn't really matter. Is it like probably in QA is just one instance? Uh, on production, probably those are many instances. Right. So. Um, First uh, thing, in order to do deployment, before you can do deployment, you actually need to build things. And uh, I will go over a uh, couple of things you can do uh, in the build process in more detail. Uh, but mostly this is going to reflect stuff we do in our organization, but I'm sure you can uh, apply the same principles or use the same techniques or even same tools uh, within your own organization, but probably you should just choose what you need, what you don't need, which is 
maybe some things are more important for you than, than for us and so on. Um, but uh, before we go into that process, uh, I would like to kind of set some assumptions, right? So I'm hoping everybody is familiar with source code and version control. Raise hand who does not use a, a version control. Okay, thank you. Um, so you're all doing that already, um, which is good. Uh, the next thing I have here is uh, that you should not put your uh, generated stuff into into your version control. And by generated, I mean things that you like uh, pull in when you do your uh, I don't know, composer install install or npm install, right? Uh, you don't put those things in. Also, you don't put things in like compiled JavaScript or compiled CSS or compiled documentation. So anything that is being generated or installed or, or something like that should not go into source uh, control, into version control. Um, and I've seen people doing this uh, the wrong way. They put, I don't know, they generate CSS um, using Gulp and then they commit that thing in and the next time somebody else generates, he again commits that thing in and it's kind of mess. Uh, and you don't, you, you, it's hard to control and it's hard to understand what's going on there. And finally, the, the last assumption about this build process I'm gonna talk about is, uh, so we have our continuous integration configured uh, so that each commit that is pushed to GitHub actually uh, gets built. Uh, again, you can use like different tools for this, uh, uh, which we will talk about a bit later. Uh, yeah, but the key thing is uh, you build everything, uh, every branch, every commit that gets pushed. So, um, I'll be doing these like random quick tips. Um, how many of you uh, do not commit your composer file in? Why don't? Okay, so he said uh, that the. Oh, I see. So basically, the answer was uh, not. You don't need it during development, right? But uh, actually, it is kind of a uh, good idea to actually commit that thing in because uh, your project can be kept in a, in a known good state. Uh, you can only update the packages you actually want to update. Uh, and this is, this is also important if you run a CI process that kind of does Composer install automatically. You can make sure that the exact same version of the package uh, you had on your dev was actually also on your CI and will be later on production. So I, I really suggest committing that thing in. Uh, and there are some other things mentioned. So developers operate on the same code base, which is kind of important, and your tests suddenly don't fail because changes uh, and, and some libraries. All right, so what happens during the build process? So the first thing, of course, after like checking out the, the, the commit from the git repo or, or any other version control repo, the first thing we do is we install project dependencies and it, it could be anything here, but uh, since this is a PHP conference, then it's composer install. We're, we set some flags, I guess, the no interaction flag is kind of important because you don't want, uh, because this like automated uh, process that that's uh, going on and you don't want uh, your composer thing to ask you questions about, I don't know, whether you want something or not, right? So you just tell it to do nothing. Also, um, uh, the preferred dist flag or preferred distributions flag is kind of cool because it kind of speeds up things quite a bit. Uh, although you might run into issues because you need to set up uh, uh, like a GitHub token for your composer to actually uh, use it. Otherwise, you'll pro probably run into those uh, uh, cache, or not cache, but rate limit issues. Of course, you can run um, other installs, like npm install. We use npm uh, for fetching in all the JavaScript stuff. 
I also have Bower installed here. We, I don't use Bower, but maybe you do. Uh, essentially, the key thing here is it doesn't really matter um, w what you are kind of fetching. The, 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 the important bit is that you don't store your uh, like third-party vendor stuff in your repo. You just install it. There's simply a file that tells what should be installed. So the next step after we have um, like pulled everything in, um, by the way, during that uh, the previous step where we install, we actually also have like dev dependencies and we install things like PHP unit. Uh, we don't rely on global stuff. We install PHP unit, code sniffer, whatnot, because we want to also have like control the versions of those tools too. Um, so. Step number two, what we do is uh, static code analysis. Um, so th the, the first tool, how many of you have heard about this uh, first tool? Okay. How many actually use this stuff? Okay, that's good. Well, I guess um, it's not that important if you run a small team uh, because then you can kind of manage those uh, guys and you can just talk to each other. But when it when your team starts to get bigger, uh, then people start to, people tend to have their own like uh, programming style, uh, have like their own programming style. And Code Sniffer is a simple tool that can analyze your code and simply check whether it's compliant with, the, with a given standard. Uh, there are like plenty of pre-configured standards shipping with the Code Sniffer. I know, uh, all the PSR standards are there. I think WordPress is there, Zend, probably Symfony as well. So you can kind of simply check whether the, the styling uh, confirm uh, does not comp sorry complies with the with the one that is set by your project. So the next tool, uh, which is kind of awesome, is PHPMD or uh, it's called PHP Mess Detector. So this tool can actually look at your code, analyze it, and find potential bugs in it. Um, uh, you, you can find more about this tool online, but I really suggest you that you try and uh, try this thing out. Um, in, in my ex uh, experience, this tool has helped like catch quite a few bugs before they even reach uh, testing phase, right? So this is pretty awesome. Um, another thing is uh, PHP CPD or uh, copy paste detector. So this thing allows you to find copy pasted code. I mean, sometimes developers tend to uh, simply grab one code piece from, from one class and put it in another, which is not really maintainable. So you can just catch things like this. Uh, and the, the last one is PHP lock, which is just, uh, uh, you can measure the size of your project. It just spits out lots of metrics, like how many lines of code, how many classes, how many test classes, how many methods, blah, 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 all that stuff. And you can like analyze this, uh, this. you can uh, draw some graphs, and maybe this helps you. Um, another kind of important thing, I think, is that, um, all these tools uh, support kind of threshold. So you can say that, let's say if you find, I don't know, copy pasted code more than, uh, more than two instances of copy pasted code, you can fail your build. Basically, the guy who committed that into your code repository will have to go back and fix it because the build is gonna be failing. Right, so next step what we do is the the testing uh, phase. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, we run PHP unit, uh, we use it for unit tests. Um, we use Codeception for what we call local tests, uh, which is, well, you know, uh, like unit tests, they test a single class, right? So you cannot really be sure that, well, even though all the small bits work, you don't know if the whole system works together. Uh, and we use Codeception to actually uh, run what we call, I said, uh, local integration tests, which is 
we're not testing a sing each single class individually. We're, we're testing, we're kind of making uh, dummy HTTP requests into our app, although it doesn't involve any web servers. So it's kind of kind of cool. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, another um, important aspect is, so these um, testing frameworks can produce uh, metrics like code coverage reports, which again can help you, um, I don't know, see potential issues in your code, like maybe this code should be unit tested, but it's not, and you can see it. Um, so it's very, very useful. And again, you can set like thresholds. If somebody commits a code uh, without unit tests, uh, which will mean that the test coverage will decrease, you just fail the build. Right, so um, the next step is what I call compile. And this is, this is kind of interesting because you can do lots of things there. Um, for instance, one thing we do in, 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 the, in the portal app is we, so since we have all JavaScript stuff actually pulled in from like NPM, uh, we then uh, run it through Gulp and we produce minified JavaScript. We do the same with less SAS, less and uh, SAS. And this is kind of cool because you can do many things with, with the source code. Like you can minify, you can uglify, um, you can replace something in it if you need to. Um, you can do pretty much whatever with it which is pretty good. Um, you can also do things like image optimization, uh, which is also what we do. We don't store uh, optimized images in our repositories. We just store very high quality images and then we optimize them during the build and we copy them over and whatnot. Another thing, um, we generate fonts from SVG. So if we have some kind of, uh, um, like icons in our website. We, we don't use GIFs or JPEGs or whatnot. Uh, we actually use SVGs and then we convert them to font files so we can use them as fonts. Um, so the, the next thing that the, about cache busting, uh, that's like totally different topic and it could be uh, a separate talk, but so you know like your static files, they should be cached for a really long time. So you can't really use a file name like, I don't know, index.js in your, in your, uh, for your JavaScript file. So what you should do instead is you should add uh, an MD5 of the file itself in the file name. So that each time your file name, sorry, each time your file changes as it gets generated, it actually changes the MD5. Thus, the next time uh, the user will hit it, and that it will be referenced in the website, it will be a different file. So it won't affect caching and you won't get into situations where uh, your users are getting old cached files because they were cached for a year or something. And you can do many more things. Um, I guess it depends very much on the project, on what you actually do in your project uh, and so on. Right. So. At this stage, you already kind of have, uh, so this process runs somewhere on some continuous integration server. It does all these steps and uh, once it's done, you actually, what you actually want to do is you want to create that build package. So what we do uh, is actually create a, a, a tarball, which is like pretty simple. We just zip it all up. Uh, you could use anything, uh, any other technology, you can use zip archives, you could do lots of other things as well. Uh, and the key thing here is that that archive, that zip file or targz file only includes the stuff you actually need to run your application. So in the case of PHP, it probably means you need uh, the application code, but it probably means you don't need the tests to run your code on production, right? So you can like sp strip down the size of the build a bit by excluding stuff you don't need. You definitely don't need node modules. Uh, if you compile your stuff into, uh, into like, if you compile your JavaScript CSS. 
most likely you don't need your git directory and there's like plenty of stuff you can ex actually exclude thus reducing the size of the thing one thing we're also excluding is like uh, PHP unit why the hell do you need PHP unit on your production server to run your app you don't so you exclude it this is just the simple uh, like a shell simple shell commands that we actually do uh, it, it's a bit like uh, cut down version we have like many more excludes there but this is just to give an example all we do is rsync exclude bunch of stuff uh, we just copy things to another directory cd into it and create a tar that's it and so then once you have that tarball or whatever you've built there you need to store it somewhere um, what we do is we upload the, the package to Amazon S3 uh, but you could use any other solution. You could use Dropbox, you could use NFS, you could use, God forbid, FTP. Uh, you could use like anything you want. But the, the, the reason why we use S3 is because you can actually add metadata to S3 objects. So you can do kind of kind of tag things in a way. You can like say that this was built from this and that comet. This was built from this and that branch or whatever, whatnot which is kind of handy. So another tip, um, tag the comment with the build number and push the, that tag to GitHub, right? So in, in the previous step where we generated the build, uh, the, the tarball, it was generated from some comment. And usually builds have numbers, right? So they usually iterate like one, two, three, four, and so on. And what we do is we we create a tag on, on the on Git with that build number for that particular comment that we just built, but only in case it passes. And the reason or the benefits of doing that is when you kind of deploy the, the build to production, you kind of know, oh, I have build one, two, three on production. You don't really know which comment it is. Uh, although you can find it, you can like back reference it, you can go into your CI service, you can check which comment was build one, two, three, and so on. But I find this much easier. Uh, just tag it, push it, you're done. You know, production is one, two, three. You know it on GitHub. It's one, two, three, easy. Um, right. So the outcome of the whole build process was the build package, uh, which can be deployed to any environment now because it, there, there's like a, it is an asset or something that it's stored and it's stored somewhere. Uh, important part is that it won't and it should not change as you move it around uh, because it, it shouldn't matter really if you're deploying to QA or staging or production the stuff that is in there should not change because you can first like push it to staging test it out and you push the exact same thing exactly the same thing to production um, it doesn't it shouldn't or it won't contain any uh, unnecessary assets which is kind of cool because it's light in that case and uh, it is easy to download and install because there's not much to install frankly because everything uh, was actually installed by your CI service like when you run the build so all you need to do is just download and extract pretty much this this is it um, right so the next stuff I'm going to talk about is um, deploying that thing. And I'll just try to go over a uh, few strategies and, and things I've found uh, when within like previous uh, experience. So I have a question for you. Um, how do you guys deploy stuff? Come on. You must deploy with Git. So you just like um, have like a, some kind of hook on production, which just pulls, and then it runs composer install. And what if it fails? Uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of fucked, right? Yeah. And what what if you need to like I don't know do npm install, which probably fails in like fifty percent cases, right? <laughs> uh, right. So few options. FTP, SSH, cron, which is kind of what you probably have. 
No, you, you just SSH it. Okay, cool. I see. Okay. Um, we have some third party services that can do this, and we have like, you could build a custom solution to actually do deployment. Well, I, I lied about FTP. I'm not going to look at it. That's like total bullshit. Nobody does that anymore. Right, so the first thing. So I, I want to go through some pros and cons. So deployment using SSH. Um, well, the biggest pro, I guess, it is very easy to implement, right? Because you don't need to do much work there. Um, you can do... Uh, rolling deployments with it, which means you can kind of... Uh, rolling deployment is where you deploy to one to, to instances one at a time. So you can check, oh, it's, it's all fine on this instance, let's move to the next one and so on. Um, the, the, the problem with this, what it, which I see is, if you want to automate that SSH thing, which you can do with some third-party services, is that whether it's a person or a or a script needs actually to get into that SS, uh, needs to get into the production box via SSH, which means you're storing your SSH keys somewhere. You're giving them away, which is kind of like crazy. Um, another thing, talking about ac accessing SSH. In our case, we don't even expose our production boxes like directly to the internet via SSH. You have to go via some bastion. So there's like no way to get in there. Uh, so that's kind of quite a big uh, con I see there. And yeah, another thing uh, which comes from like, if you run a cloud environment where things change rapidly, uh, how do you know the list of the uh, IP addresses of all your servers? You don't. I mean, yeah, in cloud, you can kind of figure them out somehow. But if you're running on not that cool cloud, it might be a problem. You might need to figure that list out on your own. So the next thing is uh, deployment using cron, which I quite like. Um, because I've used it for a long time, but I don't anymore. So deployment using cron, uh, basically you have a cron task running on your production instances uh, or any other instance in, in fact. Uh, and the key thing here is that instead of pushing something to your instances, the instances push something themselves. And this is why the, the build that I showed you how to build the, the, the build as a noun is very, uh, very cool here. Because you can have a like a script that's triggered by cron every minute, and all that script should do is pr basically check some files stored somewhere. Like the file could be stored on S3 as well. The file would be I don't know a JSON or whatever, and it would hold like a key value pairs. I need this application, this version on this instance, and that's it. And if uh, if this script detects that the, the version required is different th from the one it actually has, it would just download the, the zip file, extract, run some post-deployment stuff like, I don't know, database migrations, cache warm-ups or whatever, and simply swap the symlinks. Um, now this is kind of cool because uh, it's almost zero downtime, but I don't really think it is a zero downtime uh, thing because you have to swap those symlinks. Um, so, yeah, another, actually I have like pros and cons here. So another big con is no rolling deployment in most cases because even if you have like, I don't know, a hundred instances and they all run the same cron, they will do the update all at the same time, which might be a problem because you sometimes, in our case, we want to roll out deployment to one instance, then check it run some scripts there, check whether it's okay, and then proceed with the others. Uh, yeah, but the pro pros are it's super fast because you can do all at the same time. Uh, I think it works well for small sites and websites where you maybe don't need that zero, zero downtime deployment. And it's also quite easy to implement. It's just to write a script in any language, 
be it PHP. So another way of doing deployments, which is, I would say, much more complicated, is uh, doing deployments using some agents, uh, which usually means that there's uh, some kind of, I don't know, tool, program, uh, call it whatever you want, uh, and that tool runs on an every instance. Uh, that agent also usually announces to some uh, centralized deployment tool, which could be, again, a third party, although I hadn't seen much uh, third party tools that apply this thing or use this kind of approach. So most likely you would have to build something custom. And well, since there is something centralized, that centralized piece could orchestrate uh, code deployments to every instance. So imagine you have like uh, 100 instances, each instance is registered within the centralized bit. And then, then when you push or deploy something, you tell it to centralized, and then the like a uh, like a centralized thing just tells every instance to do something, and you can do uh, you can do like orchestrated deployments. So it means you can deploy at all instances at the same time. You can do 50-50, like. Uh, deploy to half, check something, then deploy the other half. You can do one by one. It really is a very flexible solution. Uh, another good thing about this is that you don't need access to your uh, SSH, which you do need with the SSH uh, approach, which is also good. Because it, 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 this thing is kind of a, a merged solution of SSH and cron, in a way, because with SSH you push, with cron you pull, and this is something that you push somewhere and then it pulls by itself. Well, the biggest con here is it's usually really hard to implement this stuff. And, uh, but there are cases like, in, in my case, I, I, I need to do this because we, we cannot afford any downtime. So, quick tip number three. Um, you should automate your deployment process to, to maximum. Like humans make mistakes and and humans will make mistakes one day when they do deployments, so no SSH stuff. Uh, another good thing is that if you automate things, you can rely on it and you kind of know it will work the same on each run, which is kind of cool. Um, the next point there. Um, Deployment script can be considered as a documentation, which is kind of like true, right? If you think about it. If you want to tell somebody, explain a manual deployment process, probably takes some time. Uh, whereas if it's all automated, you just tell the guy, come on, dude, just look at the script, what it does, and, and you'll know it. And of course, it's you don't need to spend time actually doing stuff. So it's kind of cool. Um, so. I want to also, well, I mentioned, like, um, I went th through the process and this all kind of involves uh, that there's, like, this tarball and then you deploy the tarball, but actually there are other options. So one thing, um, which is, I would say, pretty nice, you could build, well, I mean, you could produce a virtual machine image instead of a tarball or zip file or whatever. And th the pro is it is very robust because it would not only include code, but it also includes software like PHP and the specific version of PHP and Nginx and, and whatnot. All the stuff you need there would be there. Um, the, the biggest con I see with this is that it's like super slow. Uh, if you can build like a zip file in probably a minute, then building uh, well, I use AMIs, Amazon Machine Images, usually takes like around 20 minutes, which is too slow if you need to do a lots of deployments per day. Um, another more uh, modern or uh, more slicker solution would be to use Docker Images because you kind of get the same thing out from it. You can have software uh, uh, needed to run your stuff and you can actually have your application code as well. Um, compared to building VM images, it's like super fast. 
Uh, also, they are the, the VM images usually are probably gigabytes. Uh, Docker images probably are a couple of megabytes. Um, but the biggest con I see with this is that, well, I personally don't know how to deploy that stuff. I've been looking into tools, but um, they tend to be very different, and I haven't found one that kind of solves all the problems I want for it to be sol solved. Right. Um, so some tools I mentioned. I'll uh, I'll go over some CI tools I've used, um, and this is going to be just my personal view on them. Um, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. So. Okay, actually I have a question for you. How many of you guys use Jenkins or any other self-hosted uh, CI stuff? Okay, quite a few. And how many of you use something that is like SaaS, like software as a service? Uh, a bit less. Right, so, well, why this is here first? So, it's here because these are the things you can actually do your build on, you can also kind of do the deployment with these tools, uh, probably less with the hosted ones because the hosted ones usually bound, bound you to a, a single code repository. Um, but the, the, the best thing about hosted, which is what I like, is that first of all, um, you don't have to run it. So you don't have to care whether it goes down or not or if it's enough resources there and so on and so on. The second thing is you don't need to manually configure your stuff. Like in Jenkins, you have to set up the build, configure it, I don't know, tell it what should be run and all that stuff. And it, it doesn't go into uh, a code repository, which I find a bit like stupid because you're kind of trying to uh, put everything in that code repo and then there's just suddenly one thing you don't. It's kind of weird. Um, of course, yeah, you have to pay for those hosted ones, but on the other hand, you have to pay for the instances where you run your Jenkins as well. So yeah, just go and try it out. Um, about the code, code deployment tools. So I mentioned that uh, there are some third party stuff. Um, for instance, I use AWS Code Deploy quite a lot. Uh, it uses the agent approach and well, I mean, if you're using AWS, you should probably go and check it out because it can, it can deploy things to auto scaling groups. It could deploy things, it could deploy things to instances tagged with some certain tags. It could apply all those deployment strategies like one at a time, 50%, all at the same time. Uh, you can do lots of things there. Uh, you can even like have instances in auto scaling group. Um, behind the load balancer. You can take off each instance from the load balancer, deploy the code, put it back, and do it for every instance so that it's totally zero time, zero downtime. Um, then I haven't used much, but I know there's a, a tool called CodeShip, which is basically uh, an automated way of doing SSH, because I think what it does is you give it, uh, you give CodeShip an SSH key to your production server, and it will simply log in, run some shell scripts there or some bash commands, and that's your deployment, which is not really cool, I would say. Um, then there's like Capistrano or Fabric. Uh, pretty much, again, works the same way. It usually just SSHs into your box and runs some stuff there. Um, it's just an abstraction layer on top of bash, I would say. It makes it easier uh, to kind of Well, I forgot what I wanted to say. Makes it easier to kind of write the code that you want. Uh, right, so I'm finishing up with uh, two quick tips. Um, so one tip is don't put any config in your Git or uh, build package. So, you know, as you deploy things uh, or code to many environments like test, QA, whatever, uh, production, the, the values actually change, right? And you should not put that into that build because the build should be the same for all environments. What you do instead is you 
in your application code, you reference to environment variables and then you change the environment variables on each environment. This is like must have, must do thing. Um, and the, the, the last tip before I end is if you're really interested in this stuff, you should read this book by, uh, by Jess Humble and David Furley. It's called Continu Continuous Delivery. Um, it is a bit old, but still that all the principles apply and it's really, really great book if you're into DevOps and delivery stuff. Cool, I think that is it. Any questions? If you have any questions in, uh, in French, I won't understand, but he will translate. Uh, a little question about uh, Composer.lock. Uh, when you, after you said you you committed, but uh, how do you uh, fix uh, the conflict on, on this file? Well, when uh, one person uh, uh, update uh, one dependency and another uh, update another? Um, I'll be totally honest with you. I don't fix the conflict. Hmm? I simply run composer update locally and then just commit that thing in. That's it. Okay. Uh, but I mean, Probably resolving conflicts on composer log file is not what you want to do. It's, it's just, just uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't find the word. Did, uh, did I answer your question? No. Uh, yes. Okay. It's good. It's just for for now. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. There's another one. Uh, so um, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you didn't mention that much uh, like build tools, like uh, when you're doing your npm install, composer install and stuff, uh, is it just bash that you, you're using? Mm -hmm. um, so we, I personally use CircleCI uh, because it's cheap. Yeah, so, um, yeah, see. so we have that CircleCI file in there, uh, but when I did use Jenkins, I used Ant. But you, it could be anything. It could be Gulp itself, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, I, I guess for PHP, there's like this Ant template uh, available online, which is kind of good. Um, you could do Bash; probably works. Whatever, whatever, whatever works for you, I would say. Any other questions? I guess that's it. Oh, uh -huh. there's another one. Sorry, last question. Um, wh were you suggesting that uh, there is some kind of automatic hook that will trigger the build for every commit you merge into your uh, main branch? Or do you still do that manually? And then it will tag? Well, do you use GitHub? Yeah. Yes? Sure. So you can just set up a hook on GitHub. Whenever something is pushed to GitHub, it will send a webhook to Jenkins or whatever. In case if you use hosted services like Circle CI or Travis CI or CodeShip or whatever, they usually integrate with GitHub. They kind of set up the webhook for you when you kind of uh, sign up, sign the repository up for continuous integration. So it's like seamless process. But is it what you are actually doing in production? Like uh, no, no, no. We're um, so we're not deploying code uh, whenever so whenever somebody pushes things. We're just building it. So it's like we build it, it's ready to be deployed, and whenever we decide to deploy it, we just deploy it. Of so course, we could automate this stuff so as well. So you, you might not deploy each build, you, you may skip some yes, builds. Yes. And what we usually do is we create a build, and then we push it to some um, ser server where it actually gets tested by Selenium and all that other stuff. And only then, when we are like 100% sure it works, we just push it to production. Thank you. Thank you, Martins. Thanks. Uh, merci. Um, yeah, as I said, the last thing, please give feedback. There are the joined in links, my Twitter thing and email. Please give feedback. Thanks. <laughs>